my appearance on the girl on the milk carton can now be found on the Peacock streaming service. Unfound's first episode debuted on the first Friday of September 2016. Yes, eight years ago today. Ah, to be 46 again. During that time, this program has covered 344 disappearances over 465 episodes, including this one. To recognize this anniversary, you get to hear the first interview I ever conducted. After that, I will tell you where Unfound is headed in year number nine. I'm Ed Densel, and this is Unfound. On the phone now, I have Mrs. Mary Lau, the mother of Suzanne. Uh, Welcome to the show, Mary. Thank you. Yes. Let's start with you just talking a little bit about Suzanne, what was going on in her life at the time, um, maybe a little bit about her upbringing, her education, her interests. Okay. Um, Well, Susie uh, Susie was born in April of 19... 90, uh, 1978, and, uh, you know, right from the beginning, we kind of knew she was, she had a lot, you know, of intelligence. My husband always said there was, you know, he could see that in her. And as she, uh, you know, grew up, uh, by the time she was about nine years old, she was writing poetry, and mm-hmm. um, from writing poetry to uh, wanting to, you know, she started to hear about uh, computers, and uh, I think our first computer was a Texas Instrument computer, mm-hmm. and she really was fascinated with those. And uh, she, uh, you know, really got into the computer area, and uh, you know, eventually, you know, would take computers apart mm-hmm. and rebuild them. <laughs> yes, and. She, uh, and how old would you know, she have been at this time? A teenager? Oh, uh, she, she, yeah, she was a young teenager, maybe 13, 14 that's, years that's, old. That's, she was the only kid in school who actually knew anything about computers. Uh, at the time in school, they were just getting one into the to the library. It's a fairly big school district, but mm-hmm. you know the libraries in the different schools had one computer Mm -hmm. and if it would break down nobody knew anything about computers and they would call Susie to come and see if she could fix it which Mm -hmm. she usually could Mm -hmm. and um, you know she really uh, she had people around her all the time just fascinated by the fact that she typed so fast and she could uh, you know bring up all sorts of information on the computer where did you where do you think that she got this from I, 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 have, I no, have absolutely no idea. No idea? It just, it just seemed to come. And, and like I said, she was, you know, she was into writing poetry, so she was using a typewriter. And, you know, and then, of course, when a computer came uh, around, she could, you know, type all that information out on the, um, on the computer mm-hmm. and, you know, save all her poetry that way. Mm-hmm. So she really, you know, she really uh, had a lot going for her. Uh, when she was in high school, she was on the honor society. Mm-hmm. You know, she she was a very bright girl, and um, yeah. you know, you know, what which you, you know, it's it's uh, interesting to me that she she seems like she has this what would it be a, a, I don't know if the word or is a dichotomy of on one hand being very technical, but on yeah. the other ha- hand being very uh, well, I would maybe if I could say this artsy fartsy in poetry because I, I could say that because I'm artsy fartsy, but. Really having a passion for the arts, but having a passion for computers as well, which is a really unique combination. Yes. Yeah. Do yeah. Th- that's oh. that's the, basically uh, what she was. And, uh, mm-hmm. and we could never understand, even as a real young child, some of the poetry that she would come up with that was, you know, just so far beyond her, you know, years. I mm. mean, you know, comparing things like... Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, you know, r- when it rained one day, and she wrote a poem about rain and how the rain sound like thundering hoofs of a, a horse. Mm-hmm. You know, c- 
coming down the driveway. Right. You know, just just really, you know, far out uh, ideas of how she put this all together. We just don't know where it came from. Uh, one interesting thing was uh, one day she was taking a shower, mm-hmm. and uh, she jumped out of the shower. She had soap in her <laughs> hair, towel wrapped around her, and she ran down the hall, and they said, where are you going? And she said... She just got the idea for a poem, and she had to write it down before she forgot it. So, you know, even doing wow. that would be, you know, poems were just coming into her head all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, she even she even wrote poems about the places that she would write a poem. Uh, one time, writing a poem on a on the back of a, I think she had some bunion pads or something. It was the only paper she had, mm-hmm. so she wrote a poem on the back of that. You know, just things like that that she could, you know, really mm. came to her. She had to write it down. Backs of napkins. I mean, mm. it was just, you know, it was constantly coming into her. And uh, after she disappeared, my husband and I went through her her books, which were mm. tons of paper, and I couldn't believe all the poems that she wrote. I just can't. I could not believe it. She she was a young woman who was very in touch with her feelings and could express them, you know, not just oh, in yeah. not just speaking but writing them down, which is a particularly unique talent. Yes, yeah, that's where she was coming from, and uh, we don't know where she got it from, but it just seemed to to happen. And mm-hmm. yeah. well, having a wide diverse array of interests like that is usually uh, a sign of uh, good parenting too. You, you should know, so you should be uh, commended for that. But I'm sure you're happy, though, that she went chose to go into computers for school instead of poetry, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. I, <laughs> right? I, always, I always wondered, you know, uh, if a poet could make it in this world. And mm-hmm. I know um, it, 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 uh, there was a time when the school would publish, you know, art-type things that children had done. Um, or, yeah, actually, i calling them children, but mm-hmm. high school students. Yeah would do art type work and um, in order to some of the stuff that she wrote she said in order to get it published in this booklet which was a once a year booklet was kind of on the dark side Mm. for some reason that's what kids like to read yeah so you know some of her poetry at that point was very dark sounding Mm -hmm. and when I spoke to people who worked at the school they said they would get booklets from all the different schools, and, and most of the booklets were very dark. You know, just mm. that's what kids were like. Teenagers. Know. Yeah, teen, the teenagers. Teen, 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 yeah, teenagers. Right. Uh, so she goes to school, but she she ends up going to one school. But and what was that school again? She then she transferred. Oh, she went to um, SUNY Oneonta, okay. which is uh, about a hundred miles from where we live. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of. Uh, you know, down in uh, kind of mid-New York. Um, and when she went there, she uh, she took a computer science class. And uh, by the end of the year, she said that it was, you know, really she could teach the, the, uh, the teachers. Yeah. They didn't have the knowledge that she had at that point about computers. So sh- she decided that she would transfer to a bigger school, and that's when she came up to SUNY Albany, which, you know, Oh, maybe 35, 40 miles from here. Right. So she moved a little closer. I, I was kind of against it. I really didn't want her to move closer. But the but the um, the classes that she could take at that mm-hmm. school were, you know, a little more challenging. I think that's what she was looking for. Just that, something that that's interesting. You didn't want her to move back closer to where you lived. That's that's well, interesting. I, I, what's I, it? I really felt like um, um, I had two other children who, you know, both of them went away, you know, to a, to school, one five hours away, one mm-hmm. two and a half hours, almost three hours away. I just really felt like their, you know, their um, ability to grow a little bit mm-hmm. was to be able to be further away from home. With her being so close to home, it was... Not that I didn't want her. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's not the point. Yeah. But with her being so close to home, I just felt like she wasn't going to experience the, um, you know, learning how to live out out in the world on your own a little bit, mm. a little bit better. Yeah. See, my mom to this day is still the opposite. If I could have gone to college in my bedroom at home and 
1989, she would have. So yeah. once again, so I, I, so that was that's why I had to ask you about that. Um, how did she feel? I, I, you know, she'd just be a few younger than me. I, I was born in 1970. She would be a few years like. What year was she born again? Seventy. Seventy-eight. Seventy-eight. So she. Okay, so she was born the same year as my nephew. Okay, so I know even at the time, even the you know early nineties, mid nineties, computers for women was was still kind of in its infancy. How did she feel about you know having these classes and having an interest with, with in something that was so male dominated? Uh, I don't know. I think she just felt very good about knowing what she knew, and um, mm -hmm. she was very helpful to anybody who asked her if if uh, they could, you know, um, if if she could help them, you mm -hmm. know, uh, with their with their problems. And and many times, you know, after a class, somebody would come up to her and say, you know, geez, I'm having trouble with a certain thing. Can you? help me out. So I think she felt good about that. I really, um, I know she did, mm -hmm. um, you know, that she was able to, uh, you know, help other people who, you know, with her knowledge. Yeah, because, you know, the way I remember it, I think that women going into engineering and computers and math is, is much more common now. But I think at the time, it, a lot of women stayed away from this stuff. They might have had the interest, but they didn't because... It was such a male domin you know, male dominated industry. So I think that also that once again says something that you know very unique about her. How did she do at Albany? You know, switching you know to a tougher school. Um, How was she doing? I don't think she. You know, the thing is, I think with with uh, being in a being in college, when you go to a college, you make friends. You know, in your uh, freshman mm -hmm. year. And you kind of stay with those friends throughout the whole schooling. When she switched, she had a little more trouble, you know, making uh, close acquaintances because you mm. don't have that orientation that mm. you would have when you start out as a freshman. Mm. Um, you know, she was already a sophomore, so uh, she didn't really have a lot of close friends. She had friends, but, you know, nobody she could say, you know, this is my closest friend. I met her, you know, last year. Um, mm -hmm. So I think she had a little more trouble when she came up. I, I'm wondering if if she, you know, made a mistake, um, you know, coming mm -hmm. closer. Of course, mm -hmm. we know it was yeah, a mistake. Yeah, yeah. But, um, you know, uh, just the fact that she, um, you know, uh, mm -hmm. needed it some... I mean, she was, uh, let's just put it this way, she was getting passing grades and, and all the... Oh, yeah, okay. she was. Yeah, no, she didn't have that problem. Mm -hmm. The problem was, you know, um, uh, basically, uh, you know, the fact that it was harder for her to, to fit into groups. The social life, the socialize, socialize. So, yeah. socializing that, that goes along with college. Okay. Yeah. Sure, well, that, I guess that brings us to... Um, the, the man that she eventually did meet, and through a computer club, you know, explain to the listeners how that happened with Rich, well, meeting she, Richard, she Richard Condon. Yeah, she actually met him uh, before she went to college. He, oh, uh, she, okay. was, she was about 11th grade and um, heard about this computer, uh, computer uh, group that would meet once a week at a local restaurant and hmm. uh, convinced my husband to take her to this place, and uh, so my husband would take her down there, um, you know, once a week to meet with these people, and mm. uh, she, some of them were older. Um, that was something that bothered me a lot, was, mm. you know, and there were quite a few, you know, male right. people, of um, course. you know, yeah. more, and so uh, actually just recently uh, became acquainted with somebody, I didn't, uh, but I found out about somebody who who was the person who actually introduced Suzanne to her her uh, boyfriend, mm -hmm. the, the one she finally wound up with. Yeah. And the reason that he did was because Susie was interested in learning um, learning how to uh, do some uh, uh, my not working here. Um, learning how to do computer um, programming. Okay, and it, like a particular and, computer language or something like that? Yes, mm -hmm. and she did not know how to do that, 
and she had heard that this guy, um, who eventually became her boyfriend, mm -hmm. was a, an expert at programming. And so he was. He introduced her to to uh, this guy's name is Rich. Mm -hmm. Introduced him to Rich, and um, that's how they got acquainted. Was because he taught Susie some computer programming, and um, she she used. Uh, um, we all use Microsoft Word. Everybody uses Microsoft mm -hmm. Word, but she and Rich got into um, using Linux, right. which is yeah a lot. A lot more difficult a program. Right. So that's how they they uh, you know really got to know each other. And you know he he thought, wow, you know he he was pretty uh, pretty in tune with computers. And to meet up with a a girl that you know knew so much about computers was kind right. of, wow. So know? that was the level on which they identified with each other. That's where they really bonded, I guess you could say, was yeah. was with the computers. How long was it now? He was how many years older than she was? Uh, about a year and a half now. Okay, yeah, he so. Was, uh, one grade ahead of her. He, when she was in 11th, he was in 12th. So. And, he was, and he was organizing this at this restaurant at, the, at that early age? Yes. Wow. Yep. Okay. Yeah, because um, okay. He, he was another guy who was building computers and, you mm. know, tearing them apart and, you know, making bigger and better computers at the time when they weren't. I mean, our cell phones now have more more memory than those computers did. But, yes. you know, that many years ago, 18, 19, 20 years ago, mm -hmm. we're, we're talking about, you know, uh, top-of-the-line computers that they were putting together. So how much longer after that did they become a couple? Was it while she, when she went to college, when she went to Albany? Because he ended up no. going to the same school. Is yeah, no, right. he actually never did go to the same school as oh, he did. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, he um, he went to a uh, Catholic boys' school in the area, and uh, she, of course, went to a local high school up here in Balsam Spa, where we're from. Mm -hmm. But um, he, um, when he went off to college, he went to RPI, which Rensselaer Polytechnical Institute, mm -hmm. and Susie was still in high school. Um and then the following year, she went to uh, Oneana, which, like I said, is about 100 miles from oh, here. Right. So, um, so they never went to the same schools together. They just got to know each other. I think through that, you know, that meeting, those meetings in the restaurant, and then once, you know, they had those meetings, that's how they. Uh, you know, that's how they started together. dating. That's how they started dating. And at the at the time that Suzanne disappeared, how long had they been a couple? And I know there's some. We'll get into the particulars of that. But how long had they been been a couple? I think they'd been together uh, about two and a half years, maybe, because okay. she started dating him sometime um, as a junior in high school, mm -hmm. and then she disappeared as a freshman and uh, or a sophomore in college. So okay. about. You know, uh, two and a half years or so. Okay. We're going to come back to her boyfriend in a moment. But before you came on the air, I went through the facts of her disappearance and what she did that day and some of the times and, and things like that. Um, I just want to clear up a couple things because here we are in 2016. And there, I just want to get straight a couple facts. First of all, I'm sure you know if people are familiar with their daughter's case, they've heard about – the man in the baseball hat that appears at that convenience store at around the time that her ATM card was used the next day. What can you tell him? That guy has been exonerated, hasn't he? Yes, he has. Okay. Uh, and it took a long time before the police actually located him. But okay. they finally did and um, pretty much decided. I mean, that's what they told me is that, mm -hmm. you know, anything that they found out from him um, – you know, put didn't put him in that place, or didn't put him taking taking Suzanne. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's really all I can tell you about that. Right. I, I don't know any more than what the police told me. Right. Well, I, I, yeah, and I just want my listeners to get it straight from your mouth because, like I said, there there are still sites out there that maybe haven't been updated in a while, or they don't yeah. know some of the news that you know that can kind of put people off in, in maybe the wrong direction and of course if somebody if the police say that somebody's not being looked at anymore then we want to make sure that we put that out there uh the right. other point is about her 
her name tag from her job uh, that she was at that night. It wasn't seen a, near that bus stop that where she got off for about two months later. Like it was, she disappeared in March. Uh, I was, yeah, it was, it was uh, like early, I would say late April, early May. Okay. And, found that. okay. And was that name tag, where it was found, would that have been on the way from the bus to her to her um, dormitory, or would it have been in the opposite direction? No, it was found um, pretty much right where the, the bus left off the, the uh, passengers that night. Um, it, it actually, uh, that was a very mild winter. We did mm-hmm. not have very much snow that winter, and any time it rained, any time we had any precipitation, it was always um, kind of freezing rain, mm-hmm. but right after, and there was no snow on the ground when Susie disappeared. It was mm. very clear, just, you know, um, whatever. Okay. But that week after she disappeared, there was a small snowstorm, and I would say maybe four or five inches, not much. Um, and when the college um, plowed that parking lot, Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it had salt and sand or whatever on the parking lot, and they pushed that up over the curb. There was like a curb where the you know where yeah. the bus left the passengers off. Yes. And when they pushed the uh, the salt and sand or whatever up to the top, it went up over the top of the curb, and it was there that that badge was found. Now, from what I uh, I gathered from the police, they mm-hmm. said that right after she disappeared, of course, they didn't go out to look for about three or four days. So, But they said right after she disappeared, um, they walked that parking lot pretty much shoulder to shoulder and did not find anything. All mm-hmm. right. That, that's, this is where the confusion comes yeah. in. They found, they found nothing. Now, I'm saying that where this badge was found... Mm-hmm was up on top of this pile of sand and, uh, you know, uh, salt or whatever it was. And it wasn't until, like I said, almost, you know, a month and a half to two months Mm -hmm. after she disappeared where they found it. And um, could could somebody have come by and dropped it? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, The other thing about this was this particular badge, was one, according to the place where she worked, they were not using anymore. They were using a hang tag where you, you know, put it around your neck on a, right. a you know, a lariat, a lariat, a lariat type yes. thing. Mm-hmm. And they had the badge on that. Um, this one was a pin badge. And um, from what, what, you know, what we found, the police showed us the back of the badge, um, the pin was very rusty. Well, you know, I, I think mm-hmm. you could put something out, you know, in a day and mm-hmm. have it rust. Right, know, pretty quickly. especially it cheap metal like that, sure. Yeah, cheap sure. metal, you know. So they were saying, well, it was here for a long while. Well, we, we can't decide that it was. It was cracked. Mm-hmm. I would say that, you know, maybe a car drove over it or something, so it was cracked. But other than that, there wasn't really much else we could find out about that badge other than it was found by two students uh, who were walking through the parking lot, and they found it. And they first picked it up, thought it was a credit card, because mm. the size of a credit card, right. yeah. and threw it down. And then uh, the one girl picked it up and said, oh, there's a girl that's missing. Let's look at this. And they looked at it, and there was her name. So, wow. you know. Uh, was it uh, Suzanne's habit to... Like, if she left work, would she have just left the t- name tag on, like, to go home? And, yeah, and some people, yeah. Yeah, people I mean, do what, do, what do, do you, all the time. okay, would you say that <laughs> that was her do. habit to do that probably, too? Because some people, yeah. you know, they're going to take I it off. Say, well, I don't want somebody to know that I work at this store, or, you know. Or well, some, you know, the unusual thing about this, and, you know, there's people always say there's always some something there we're missing here yeah. along the way, but... Yeah. Um, the unusual thing is the fact that she never liked to wear the clothes that she had to wear to work, um, at, you know, out, mm. out of work. So mm. she would bring a bag of clothes, 
the, you know, and it was like a, a, I don't know, tan colored pants and a certain colored shirt. I can't remember what it was, but it was the logo of the company that she worked for. So she would bring them with her, change at work, then once she got done with work, she would mm. change the clothes back and put them back in a bag and carry them home or carry them back mm. to the dorm. Mm-hmm. So if she would do that, taking the badge off, too. Right. So that's that's always been a question high on my list. Yeah. <laughs> but I never got any good answers to that. Uh, do you have an knowledge if she changed clothes that night? After she, oh yeah, she did. Oh, yeah. She absolutely did. She, okay, she absolutely did. Uh, the uh, the man that she worked for, you know, the, her mm. boss at the mm. time, said that Susie would come in a little bit early uh, to work, so she could she could um, you know get into her work clothes and always started a little bit early, which meant that she could leave five minutes before the bus would come, and she'd mm. leave five or ten minutes you know, before the bus would come and change back into her, her, uh, you know, outdoor clothes, basically jeans or whatever the kids were wearing at the time. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, she would take those clothes off. She didn't want to wear those clothes out. I don't know why, but <laughs> that was her habit, you know. Well, maybe a, a fashion, you know, statement of some type, <laughs> you know, self-conscious about her fashion or something like that. I, 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 I think I've known people who've, I've, I think I've had one or two jobs like that, you know, in my life where it maybe has like the name of a store or something on there. And, you know, yeah, like McDonald's or right. something. You don't want to wear your McDonald's uniform out, out you know, advertising the uniform. Yeah, may, oh. maybe, maybe not. Uh, but yeah. just going back to the name tag. So what, it's possible that that night the name tag falls out. It sits there somewhere around the bus. She disappears. It sits there for a couple days. Nobody notices it. And then the storm comes. The snow gets pushed away. The name yeah. tag gets caught up in the snow. And then these months later, or eight weeks later, the snow melts. And then the name tag appears. It that's, shows up. That's yeah. possible. That's possible. Okay. Yeah. Great. I just wanted to get that on the record. Okay, great. Um, let's move on once again. Uh, I guess back to the boyfriend. The next day, he calls you and tells you that Suzanne has disappeared. Yeah, he says, um, it, how did he word it? He worded it so that it didn't sound like, you know, geez, you know, Susie disappeared. What are we going to do about it? It wasn't like that. It says, mm-hmm. you know, did you know Susie didn't come home last night or something like that? And it was like a shock to me because I was getting ready. My husband was... Uh, reading the newspaper, I was getting ready so that we could go to meet my son. It was going to take me out for my birthday, which was the day before Susie disappeared. Oh and um, so he called, you know, my son said, you know, we'll go out for lunch. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I was getting ready. The phone rings, and, and he says, you know, did you know Susie didn't come back last night? It was like, what are you talking about, you know? Yeah, <laughs> I was like yeah. a little bit in shock yeah. because... Uh, you know, why didn't you call me last night, <laughs> and why are you saying that? And he, so I, I gave the phone to my husband, and my husband got the information from him saying that, you know, Susie didn't come back. He had tried to get into her computer, which he did. He got into her computer mm-hmm. and, um, you know, looked at different uh, emails or whatever. Right, we're gonna, well, yeah, we'll get into that. Or, we'll get into that, too, but for... Well, yeah, we'll get into that. But he calls okay. and says, and and then yeah. he, he you hang up the phone and you go to Albany. My husband went right down to Albany. Yeah, okay. I stayed here um, because I thought, you know, if if there were any phone calls, somebody would call me and I'd be here. Um, that was before, you know, I mean, cell phones were just coming yeah. in. So yeah. We didn't have the cell phone. Yeah. But, um, you know, I... I uh, here and Doug went to Albany to, uh, you know, go and talk with the police because the police weren't taking any report from just a boyfriend, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. and, uh, you know, they were, they were trying to convince us that, uh, uh, well, maybe she just came home and she went and stayed in somebody else's room, fell asleep and, you know, she'll mm-hmm. show up again, you know, basically yeah. they poo poo in the whole thing. So, you, um, let me ask you this, if you know. Uh, did Suzanne and, and Rich have 
you know, I'll admit I'm single at 46, but I know most people who are in relationships or married, they have kind of like a schedule. They call people at certain times of the day, maybe after they get off of work or, or something like that. Yes. Would it have been Suzanne's inner habit maybe to call him when she got back to her dorm or something like yes, that? Yes, that, that was the habit, and okay. that was basically the reason why he, you know, um, he did not contact us right away. When she got back, she usually got back to her dorm about quarter to 10. She mm-hmm. left work at 9.30 or 9, 9.25 so that she could run to change her clothes and then catch the bus uh, back to the campus. Mm -hmm. And the campus made no stops between the mall she worked at and where she got off at Visitor's Parking Lot, and it was about a 10-minute ride. And uh, so she made, you know, Mm -hmm. when she would get back to uh, to her dorm, which would have been about quarter to 10, she would make a phone call to him or mm-hmm. she would email him to let him know that she mm-hmm. was back. And uh, she didn't do it that night. And he started, according to her roommates or, you know, her uh, their quad mates, because mm-hmm. this is like a, a four-room a four room quad okay. that she lived in. And according to them, they hadn't heard her come in. Um, she normally would come in and she had a lot of keys on a, key fob and it would hit the door and they could hear the noise when she walked in Mm -hmm. and they never heard that so but all they heard all night long was the phone ringing the phone kept ringing and ringing because he was trying to call so there is a record of at least somebody trying to call her on her phone that night trying to reach her figure out where she was we don't know necessarily if it was him or not but somebody was looking for her somebody was looking for her okay yeah yeah. That was it. Okay. So the next day, don't quite know about the ATM situation yet, but you start this search, and does the does um he take part search? in it? He, I don't know what he actually. I think he might have tried, you know, getting a hold of the police. I don't think he ever really went to the campus. Mm-hmm. My husband went to the campus. Um, and he called around 9.30 in the morning, which, you know, we're, we're saying 12 hours after she was not heard from. Mm. So we've got 12 hours gone already. And so Doug goes down to the campus, and it, t- it takes him, you know, got himself right down there. And he was down there by um, maybe 11 o'clock in the morning. And he went right to the police and, you know, talked to them. In the meantime, I thought, what do I do while I'm sitting here? Um, and I thought about her credit cards, and I thought maybe because all her credit card statements would come to us, mm-hmm. and she had maybe two credit cards. She didn't have a lot, but th- they would come here. Her bank, you know, book. I knew what she had in her bank account because all the statements would come here, and um, so I started to call. Uh, I called because I knew she had an ATM account, so I called it. I think by the time I figured that all out, it was around, um, you know, 2.30 or, or about maybe, yeah, quarter after 3, I'd say, that I got a hold of an ATM agent for her ATM card. And I was talking to this woman on the telephone. She was in Seattle, Washington. And I'm looking at the clock. And about 10 minutes before, mm-hmm. she says to me, I think that card just got used. That had to, that had to been a that had to been a crazy moment for you. That had that to been was. a really surreal uh, moment. Was. Yeah. And I'm saying, where did it get used? And she said, I can't tell you that because we, you know, that this particular company was Cirrus, mm-hmm. and Cirrus gets their receipts the next day. At that time, I don't know what they do now, but at that time, that you know, all the receipts for the day before would come into the um, into the company the next day. And she said, I can tell you tomorrow morning, but I can't tell you right now. And I said, well, can you tell me anything about it? And she said, um, the PIN number was a direct PIN number, direct hit on the PIN number. So, and, then, and what that means is that somebody used the card and somebody got the PIN right the first time. Right the first time. Nobody like tried to mess around, hit one, two, three, no. four, one, two, three, five. It was no. whatever it was the first time, boom. The first time it was the right PIN number. Okay. 
So um, I was, you know, like, what else can you tell me? She's I can't tell you anything else. So first, first thing the next morning, this woman, like I said, Seattle, Washington, she called me up and she told me that um, the receipts were turned in and uh, $25 was taken out of the uh, account. Mm -hmm. And that was it, which was kind of the usual thing that $20, I'm sorry, $20, $20. Was, was the usual thing that she had taken out. And she had taken out the day before, the day she disappeared, at around, I would say, 4 o'clock or, or 3.30 or 4 o'clock, uh, from a bank across from the campus, she had taken 20 out. And then she got to the, um, she got to the uh, mall where she worked and took 20 more out at the mm-hmm. mall. So, you know, maybe to buy supper, I don't know. Now, I'm going to ask you this because, once again, this is going to become, uh, for the listeners, this is going to become relevant later. Are you sure she used the card both those times? Definitely. Yes, I believe that, yes, because at the time, uh, there was a a camera at the bank where she took the first 20 out. And when she got to the mall, I believe there was a camera in the mall at their ATM machine where she took the second 20 okay. out. Okay, so they saw her there and both mm-hmm. times. Okay. So it was her. But when they got to the the uh, place where the the card was used. On March 3rd. On March the 3rd, well, I was on the telephone with the ATM mm-hmm. person. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the surveillance camera was not over the ATM machine. Right. It was it was over the counter where the cash register was for the store that uh, the convenience store that she uh, that you know was used. So the camera is it, to, once again for the listeners. What that means is that the camera was pointed at the registers, probably because the owner of the store might have made, wanted to make sure somebody wasn't ripping them off. In yeah. contrast to like today, almost 20 years later, where it seems like every convenience store has like 10 cameras all over the place. Yeah, exactly. There was only the one camera over okay. the cash register in that convenience store. And where was the ATM in that in that store? Just inside the doorway. So when somebody would come in, they could go right to the ATM machine, do their business, uh, get money out, maybe go to the mm. counter and buy what they wanted to buy and have the cash on hand. Right. That particular machine gave cash. Okay. Some some machines give script, but that one I was told gave cash. Right. And this, by the way, is this is also how the guy with the Nike hat got involved because he was in the store right around the time that that ATM spit out the money. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So that's how that all ties itself up together. And and the reason that you saw the Nike hat was because the camera was overhead, so it was right. kind of a, be- a bird's eye view. So all you got was the the hat with the brim and maybe a little p- part of this guy's nose. Really, no facial, you know, um, right. familiarity. You couldn't get, you know, there was no face there. I mean, it was basically but the, his. But the police finally found him somehow. Finally located him. He he had a. Um, what did he have a, a jacket? He had a, yeah. it was a a winter jacket that was a, a particular brand, and that was another reason that he was identified was because of the jacket, the hat, and it, it was months later when they finally identified him. It right. wasn't like overnight. They, yeah, and that's you know it took a long time to find him, but they did find him. They did find. That's why it's weird. Eighteen years Car later, Hart. that that yeah, okay, that's the name of the the make of the jacket, the company, right? Yeah, right. the company of the jacket. Yeah. Right, and that's but going back, you said it took them a while, but still, you'd think eighteen years later that you know some of these people would would clean their you know their information up. How did her boyfriend find out that she was missing? He called you, but how did he find out? Because she didn't call him, so he tried calling her, Okay. and he kept calling her and calling her, claiming that that's what he did. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I think my husband asked him, well, why didn't you go down there? And he, he said he didn't really have an explanation. But when the police talked to him, his explanation was he was, he, uh, or his, his uh, alibi was he was playing a game on the computer with one of his friends. And his friend... Um, when she disappeared. 
when she disappeared, okay. yeah. Okay. And this friend identified him by the fact that he said, I knew all his moves. In other words, the moves on this particular mm -hmm. game. Mm -hmm. okay. It should, playing. how far, and we maybe need to clear this up too, how far did her boyfriend live from the Albany campus? He didn't go to school there, but he lived close. Yes, he did. He lived maybe, um, I would say, if he got on the, on the north way, probably about 10 to 12 minutes okay. away. Yep. Not very far. Okay, getting back to the question of how he, he found out. So he just took for granted that because she didn't pick up the phone, not even the next day that he never she never came back, or did finally somebody pick up the phone in that dorm, or did he drive down there and find one of her roommates or something, and they said, no, Suzanne never came home last night. No, he just decided that she was missing. That that was what his... Okay. That's right. You know, the, the, just talking to you about this really brings a lot of this back, you know. I mean, these are questions that mm -hmm. need to be asked from the police again. You know, we mm -hmm. need to go over this and over this. Yeah. There's a there's a clue somewhere. Well, I, I I ask the questions because either I don't know them or haven't read them and I, you know, I don't that want this, I don't want you to, I don't, I'm, this is not a point of trying to relive this over again no. for you. You know, that's, that's not why I do this, but no. I, I'm just asking questions as you're answering them. You know, I yep. just some just a thing that pops into my head. Once again, if you can answer it, great. If you don't know, that's fine too. You know that that's yeah. fine too. Um, now you did a show. Now we should say any something before we continue. Nobody has. There is no suspect in this crime. Nobody's been, like. There's a woman that I've interviewed uh, that's going to be on a future show, and she always likes to say nobody's been included. Nobody's been excluded in the disappearance of Suzanne Lau. Okay, that is right. a fact. All right, that's a fact. Right. We have to establish that right now for the listeners. Right. However, you did a show. Uh, you did a show called Disappeared back in yes. 2011, 2012, where you were very. Uh, let's put it this way: there was a strong feeling there that you thought that her boyfriend had something to do with it. Okay, yes. now t can you talk about that? Yeah, I can talk about it. Um, you know, for a long time the police pretty much said, don't say anything, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, 18 years have gone by, and I just got to the point where I just couldn't hold back anymore. But, you know, just the fact that here was a guy who claimed to be her boyfriend, lived about 10 to 12 minutes away from the campus, realized mm -hmm. that she didn't come home that night, and didn't drive down to find out where she was. Mm -hmm. Most people would say, Yes, um, you know, if it was my boyfriend or girlfriend, I'd want to know where they were, you know. Right, <laughs> I want right. to go check, you know. Yeah. Most boys, most guys would do that. And now, do you did, think that he didn't, now, this is once again another point that was, you know, that we've talked about, you know, when we originally talked. Could it be the reason he didn't go down there is because maybe they weren't a couple anymore? Well, I was wondering that also, but, um, you know, from the fact that he did call the next day to tell us, you know, that she mm -hmm. didn't come back to her room, so they could have, maybe he still thought they were a couple. I thought around Valentine's Day that she gave him the Dear John letter, but we never knew for sure. You know, that was only mm -hmm. two weeks before she disappeared. And I know that every time she tried to break up with him, he would just, get very emotional and throw a real fit about it. So, And she was the kind of a person who couldn't take that kind of emotion, you know, that yeah. she always felt sorry for, you know, the underdog, basically. Yeah. So I'm just wondering if he had her pretty much, you know, under his thumb. Do you think that that is something that she would have explicitly told you? Hey, Ma, you know that I broke up with Rich last week. Do you, do you think I that was... There were, I knew there were times when she, uh, she tried... Um, you know, where she, and she didn't actually tell him in person. Mm -hmm. She would write a long letter and then hand him the letter, and he would get home, open the letter, and about 10 minutes later, you'd hear the telephone ring, and you'd hear her on the phone, you know, arguing mm -hmm. with him, and eventually, you know, they would get back together again. So this was a relationship that had its ups and downs. It sure did, yep. Okay, did. okay. So once again, we just have to establish that he is—he has been interviewed by the police, maybe not recently, 
No. But at the time, maybe a little, a few months after, wherever, whenever, he's been interviewed. He has seemingly a decent alibi with yeah. the, the video. Of course, nobody saw him. No. But he's playing video games. This friend, whoever he is, is vouching for him. That alibi has never been broken. No. Okay. However, given that he is a computer expert, just like Suzanne was, maybe yeah. there's the possibility that he could have maybe programmed the computer to do something because there are, you know, that. that they, always been my contention is that he programmed that computer to play that game. And mm -hmm. was not in, uh, not where he said he was. And, you know, um, right after he a, after Susie disappeared and the police would want to talk to him and his family, they finally got a lawyer, a um, right. very high-priced lawyer. And that was it. Police can't, unless you have, you know, probable cause, you cannot mm -hmm. bother the person anymore. So basically the victim has less rights than the perpetrator. Yeah. That sent up red flags for me. Yeah. Um, let's move on to let's move on to, to something else. And it has to do with and this this is takes us to the NETM question again. That Rich and Suzanne had a favorite movie movie called Hackers. That's All right. right. And yes. you told me about that the first time we talked. I've watched the movie. All right. Yeah. I, I, I watched it from beginning to to end, and I can tell you, I even took a few notes during it. The you know just to kind of run through my head after I was done watching it. You know, it's kind of it was kind of interesting seeing Angelina Jolie, twenty one years ago with the, you know she had this very boyish haircut and right. it was very nineties. You know, and being twenty five at the time that the movie came out, it certainly brought back some memories. But there's a specific part in that movie that is relevant to this case. And it's right. almost like a weird coincidence, almost, yeah. if you believe in that sort of thing. In the movie, in the first quarter of the movie, the, one of the, it's a, the movie of Hackers is about these people, as you can imagine, computer, young computer kids in high school, um, kind of like, uh, I guess from my generation, we've been like Ferris Bueller's day off, going in and switching his grades. Well, these guys did a lot more, were doing a lot more than that in this movie. Right. And the one guy was bragging about what getting into an ATM machine, hacking it, and causing it to sp spit out money somewhere. All right? Yeah. And then here we have just three years later, that movie came out in 95. In 98, you have Suzanne disappear, and the next day that ATM in that store spits out that $20 bill, and seemingly nobody saw anybody come in and use that machine. Now, granted, it wasn't caught on camera, but nobody remembers anybody using the machine. Well, the police actually, um, when they when they realized the ATM machine might be, you know, some factor, they were able to get um, about a half an hour before and a half an hour after that time frame that um, for uh, mm. three. Uh, 350, you know, 10 minutes before, um, of all the people who used the machine. And they were able to speak with everybody. And that's how this Nike guy, the one mm -hmm. they refer to as the Nike guy, right. um, was the only one that they could not identify right away. He was the only one. And that's why he became a suspect. And basically, mm -hmm. he became a suspect because the, the boyfriend's family decided that he should be the suspect. Mm -hmm. And they were the ones who put up all the posters with his picture. Uh, uh, really the boyfriend, boyfriends, it. Rich, the boyfriend's family put those posters up. Yeah, and they also bought a billboard with uh, Susie on one side of the billboard and the Nike man on the other side. You can you identify this man. So that would throw any suspicions away from anybody else for a long time, and it did. That billboard was up for six months. Now, it, sh it should also be noted, nobody saw Suzanne go in and use that machine that no. day. No. No. And, it, and this was the other thing about that was it was about uh, two and a half miles from the campus. 
Mm-hmm. Susie wasn't much of a walker, and I don't think she would have walked down there. She did not drive. She didn't have a driver's license or a car. Mm-hmm. And uh, in order to take a bus, it would have been out of her way to get a bus to that area. So I don't think Susie was there. I know she was. Did you not also tell me the first time we talked that a branch of her bank is very close to there? Right across the street. So if she's going to go so, use the, if it was her that day, and maybe, yeah. maybe she had some sort of, you know, um, you know, let's just, uh, you know, some sort of, uh, I don't know what, you know, the medical term, but kind of just an amnesia or something like that. If she needed to use the ATM, it could re- look at this card and say, "Well, I have this ATM," and maybe she knows the number. She would have gone to the bank, not to the. She would have gone across the street. Yeah, right. Susie was smart enough to right. spend any extra money if she didn't. And she had talked to me, actually, on my birthday, which was March the 1st, mm-hmm. um, and she said she said how she was low on money. Um, and if, you know, I said, well, do you want me to send you some? Because I could have put some money in her bank account because I had access to her bank account. And she said, no, she could wait till Thursday of that week because that was the day she was going to get paid. And she still had enough, you know, cash left in the ATM that she could take cash any time she needed it. So, and mm-hmm. also the, the other thing was um, after she disappeared, there was a, a little jar full of money um, on her desk full of change. So it was like, you know, not a mm-hmm. lot, maybe 8 or $9 in change mm-hmm. that she used for the, you know, the washing machine and probably for... Uh, you know, candy machine or whatever. So, you know, it wasn't like she was completely broke. Yeah. So, you know, why would she go all the way down to this convenience store, you know, about two and a half miles from her campus when she had stores all around? And, you know, uh, across the street from the campus, there was an ATM um, machine in a bank that was her bank. So, you know, I don't think that was her that did that. Uh, I'll ask you this. Does the boyfriend have an alibi for where he was when the ATM was used? We know he has an, an, an alibi for he, the, the night he before. He was out looking for her. Okay. But we don't know. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, let's move on uh, to something else. And once again, we're going to have to say for the record that um, nobody has been included or excluded from this investigation. Okay. That's yeah. why it's still unsolved. Um, 18 years later, yeah. we haven't talked about, let's just, I know we, we had a wide ranging interview the first time we talked, but I want to just keep it to this. The, the boyfriend's father assisted in the search for Suzanne. Okay. But what happened? I, I don't really, I don't, I don't remember saying that he, he did. Well, well, I guess what I'm trying to put this lightly he started calling in, having sightings of Suzanne. Dean. Oh yeah, yeah. He he. Actually can we can was, we talk about can we talk about that? Do you feel comfortable sure. talking? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He he actually um, he would tell the police, you know, how he was. I think at one time he was like an auxiliary policeman, whatever that means, mm-hmm. you know, in this little town or whatever. Big deal, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and I remember we were in we were waiting in a room. Um, at the campus, and one of the things that he said out loud was to his son, if you think you've, you've met the police, you know, regular police, wait till you meet the state police. You know, in other words, they're the big guys. You know, mm-hmm. they're the ones that are going to really take over. So he, he was really kind of I, almost uh, enamored with police-type people. So uh, several weeks after Susie disappeared, he called the state police to say he was he said, I know what happened to Suzanne. I was driving uh, down the road, and uh, I saw a car that looked just like my son's car. Same color, same stickers on the car. Everything was exactly the same. He said, so I pulled up alongside so I could wave, mm-hmm. and the guy that looked at me looked just like my son, but it wasn't my son. So he figured that night this guy must have gone to the campus Mm-hmm. This fictitious guy, okay, and and Susie when she got off of it, he knew when she got off the bus 
and, you know, called her over, and she thought it was my son, and she got in the car with him. So that was his first story. Okay. Another story that he, he continued to... Uh, now, to, just for the record, how do you know that happened? Just the police told you that? Oh, yeah, the police told me. And there are police yeah. records in the state of New York right now that that happened. Just, once yeah. again, for the record, yeah. for the listeners. Yep. Okay. Yep. All right, please the continue. Thing, okay, go ahead. The other thing was um, he was a truck driver himself at the time, and he drove his truck to um, uh, a small town about 25, 30 miles away from here uh, called Amsterdam, Gloversville, Amsterdam area. And he, he said he would stop at this coffee shop every, every day that he drives the truck there. And he said, I'd see Suzanne sitting out on a bench just outside this coffee shop. Um, which <laughs> kind of threw me for a loop okay. there because how in the heck would she get there? But anyway, um, he would see her sitting on the bench. So he told the police this. He said, I saw her at least eight times. And so the police said, look, I'm going to give you one of our telephones. The next time you see her on that bench, you call us. We'll have a policeman there in two minutes. And uh, so, you know, two weeks went by, and they actually had some undercover police following him around. And um, they saw, they saw um, he, he uh, got on the telephone, and he called, and he said, she's out there sitting on the bench right now. And the other two police are saying, what's he talking about? There's and the, the two cops are right there as well in an unmarked yeah. car, seeing what the, the father's there. seeing, yeah. and they're seeing nothing. Nothing. They saw nothing. So that was, you know, that was another sighting, you know, uh, debacle. I'm and going to, he, I'm going to guess that the calls probably stopped shortly after those sightings stopped shortly after that. If the, yeah, but he did. He had one more where there's a there's a college here in Schenectady. It's called uh, Union College, and he claimed he was driving. It was like I don't know, May or June, very hot day, and he said I saw Susie in her long winter coat and boots walking through that campus um, in, in uh, Union College um, that particular day. He called the police to tell him that. Is he crazy? I don't know, but yeah. that was another one that, you know. Did you get to know him very well while, the, while Suzanne and Rich dated? Did you get to know him? Uh, I didn't really get to know him very well. Um, Susie did. I know she, you know, they were going out, and he would, they would see each other every weekend. Mm -hmm. And that was the one thing that was kind of unusual was um, the mother claimed that the father didn't know Susie very well. And I said, I, I got upset with her, and I said, how can you say that? She saw him every weekend mm -hmm. that they dated. Mm -hmm. And there were times when, you know, he would come out and try to, um, you know, help his son fix the car, and the two of them were there. I said, she knew that. And then when we brought Susie down to Oneana, he showed up with some carpets and things that Susie had stored, uh, you know, mm -hmm. in a, a storage locker. Uh, the father, the mother, and the son all showed up at Oneana. So it wasn't like he didn't know her. He knew her. Um, so I don't, I don't know. I, so I get, but what you're, so he was, family. so what you're saying is that the family of her boyfriend were helpful at times. I mean, they showed up and brought some things and. Not that we asked them to. No. And I <laughs> okay, remember no. when they showed okay. up at Oneana, I said, right. I, I remember, you know, we, we were going to take Susie out to eat after, and I remember seeing, um, uh, them show up and I, I said to her right away, I said, there's no way they're going out to eat with us. You know that already, don't you? And she was, yes, I do. Okay. I said, okay, because <laughs> I, I didn't care for any of them. I, and that was before she, long before she disappeared. I didn't mm. like them. But just to be clear for the record, what you're saying here is on the record, New York State police or local police stuff, these, these things that he did that turned out to be false sightings. Yeah. All right? Okay. Just this is not some... You know, sour grapes or anything like that. We're just, I, once again, I know you're telling the truth, but I just want to hear, you know, I want to make sure my listeners understand that. Okay? Right. That, that's all I'm trying to do with this. Okay. Because as long as there is a record of that happening, then, you know, then that's, then that's factual to me. Um, 
what do you think happened to your daughter? I I really wish I I could you know um, look at a magic ball and say I know exactly what happened to mm-hmm. her. I really don't know. I I know that she made it back to the campus that night. She mm-hmm. was witnessed by a, a girl who was getting on the bus um, that mm-hmm. saw her getting off the bus, mm-hmm. and so I know she made it to the campus. From that then on, I really don't know. My feeling is that her boyfriend or some member of his family came mm-hmm. to the campus, and she knew them, and she would get in the car with any of those people, and mm-hmm. something bad happened. I just, I okay. really don't know. You know, um, the the theme of this this uh, show, that I, you know, and I, I can't thank you enough, and we're going to continue on with some other things. We're going to move on to what you've been doing since. Um, but this this show, the theme of it is about transitional areas, about safety, you know, being aware of the, your surroundings and, and things like that, because that was what really struck me uh, about, uh, you know, your daughter's case. And I told you from the beginning, this is still a case, I think, that can be solved, I, I think, you know, with, you know, with the right, um, you know, sleuthing, investigates, cold case work or whatever else. But with each of these shows... You know, I try to teach the listeners about something, and, and I do think about women out there uh, today, 2016, who, you know, have their heads in their phones, this, there, and they set themselves up for being oh, abducted, yeah. being abducted, being attacked, being raped, you know, and becoming a missing person. I'm not, I don't think that's what happened in your daughter's case, okay? But she was in one of those transitional areas, moving from the bus to her dorm, you know, those are the places, those transitional areas. You'll see a lot of self-defense experts uh, talk about that. So for any of you women out there listening, this is the stuff you really have to be aware of. I don't care if it's on a college campus, places that you're, uh, places that you're familiar with. If somebody has their eye on you and you're not paying attention to your surroundings, um, you know, you could be, you know, setting yourself up. Now let's move on to, to what's uh, been going on since... I, talk to me about Suzanne's Law. Okay. Um, there are actually, I have two laws. Please, um, tell us about them. Yeah. Um, Suzanne's Law, uh, there, the first law that we passed was in uh, uh, 19, it was called the uh, New York State College Safety Act of 1999, and it actually became law in 2000. And uh, it was an act to amend the education law. Uh, in relation to requiring colleges and universities to implement plans uh, for the investigation of violent felonies and reports of missing students occurring on their campuses. Um, So uh, basically, uh, they they wanted, uh, you know, the police to actually have some sort of a plan in place so that if if a kid went missing on a college campus or if there was anything violent like rape or whatever, Mm -hmm. um, they were able to, um, you know, have, have a plan so that all police agencies would get involved in this. And that became a New York state law in 2000. Um, and then, um, in 2008, it became a federal law, uh, Mm -hmm. and it's called the Suzanne, Suzanne Lyle's uh, Campus Safety Act is a federal law now, and that was uh, 2008 um, Mm -hmm. when that one was passed. In 2003, we we had been working well to try to get Suzanne listed with the National Center for Missing Children, but the National Center for Missing Children did not take. children after the age of 18, up to the age of, uh, they would only take them up to the age of their 18th birthday. So Mm -hmm. once you became 18, that was it. And we felt that students that, you know, are in college or, you know, graduate and up to the age of 21, they're kind of vulnerable. That's a whole vulnerable group. Yes. And we worked very, very hard to get a law passed. And in uh, 2003, that law became Suzanne's law. 
Um, okay. And it requires the national, uh, it requires police to notify the National Crime Information Center when someone between the ages of 18 and 21 is reported missing as a part of the National Amber Alert Bill. And um, so now what that law did is it actually um, uh, raised the age to, from 18 to your 21st birthday. And now once the police make the call, they can call the National Center for Missing Children and get those children listed with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Um, right. And uh, the, the beauty of this law is that people who went missing before this law went into place, before 2003, can be grandfathered into the system. So um, I have a one lady I can, I, uh, that I can put my finger on right away. Her son went missing. He was 20. He was uh, at, at the uh, Columbia University, and he went missing in 1972. And this woman never had any, any, you know, areas to look or search or any help or anything like that. And we got him listed with the National Center for Missing Children. So this man now is in his 60s, but he's still listed on their webpage wow. as a missing person because he went missing at 20. So that's the beauty of this law. So I really feel that Suzanne's law put a lot of uh, young young people who never would have had any, um, you know, help mm -hmm. or the families any help uh, with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. What was that process like? I mean, getting, you know, you've, you've become an advocate now and then getting involved with, with the politics, getting a law passed. What was, what was that experience like for you? Well, it was, uh, it was, <laughs> it was interesting because when the first law passed in New York State, and I'm thinking, wow, this is pretty easy. I didn't mm. know you could pass laws that easily. And people would say to me, how did you get this thing passed? I don't know if it was because she was an attractive college student that went missing that, you know, the law passed right away or mm. what. But um, then we found out that we really had to, uh, you know, become a non-for-profit organization in order to really – have some, you know, uh, you know, fight behind us, basically. So mm -hmm. we became an, uh, a uh, non-for-profit organization to help other people with missing family members. And once we did that, it seemed very easy to talk to representatives or, you know, mm -hmm. federal representatives to see if we could pass another law or to even, uh, you know, get, uh, get our campus safety law was 2008. And at the time, um, she now is New York State Senator, um, federal senator, but her name was Christian Gillibrand, and she was a mm -hmm. representative. Mm -hmm. And at that time, she hadn't passed a law yet. <laughs> wow. So we went to see her, and guess what? She worked hard with uh, Char uh, Charles Schumer, uh, mm -hmm. Senator Schumer, and the two of them passed the uh, Susie M. Lyle Campus Safety Act um, in 2008. That had to feel like a, quite an accomplishment for you. It was a big accomplishment, and it was a big accomplishment for her, too. And yeah. the one that passed in uh, 2003 was another one um, that uh, we actually spoke with a, a representative, and he, you know, he said he filibustered all night, and then the, the next morning he called us to say we passed the law. He said, wow, that's great. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it was, you know, we, we said... I can't believe this happened. People would say to us, how do you get those things going? I don't know. It just worked. It just, we hit the right people at the right time. Yeah. And yeah. And yeah, you, you're not, these people aren't going to drop through the cracks anymore. No, no, that's the way I look at it. And anytime I get a phone call from a family member that says, you know, their child 18 to 21 has gone missing, I immediately get them hooked up with Susie M's Law and, you know, to get, get a hold of the National Center for Missing Children. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to have your police agency call, but it's a federal law. They have to do it now. And that helps them because, uh, you know, they get, they can request posters if they need, you know, posters. They, they can request um, uh, 
investigators that are retired that will look at your case, they, you know, they'll get a lot of help that they wouldn't have gotten had they, you know, um, not, were not able to get into uh, the National Center for Missing Children. If it's a child under the age of 18, they'll take them right away. But mm-hmm. anybody over that age of 18 to 21, it's a, it's a little sticky. Yeah, probably because a lot of those kids, you know, they now have their independence. You know, some of them do leave the house on their own. You know, they dis- right. you know they disappear on, on on their own. In fact, probably if there was some study done, I'm sure you'd find that 18 to 21 a you know age range is probably being most likely to just say, "Heck, I'm out of here," and you know, and yeah. it not tra- technically be a disappearance. It's just somebody moving from New York to California. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. and you know, and and you yeah. find families that have lost touch with these children, and you know, and then all of a sudden they say, "Wow, I haven't talked to a so and so for a long time." You know what's happened to them, and then find out that they're they're no longer around, or they got caught up with, you know, some bad situation that you know they mm-hmm. can, they can't get out of, which is what happens to a lot of those young people. You know, I want to ask you a question. If you have an, some insight into it, I'm sure the listeners lo- would love to have to hear you talk about it. You've turned uh, Suzanne's disappearance into two laws. Uh, it's quite an accomplishment. We know of other uh, parents, family members, for example, Kelly Murphy, Project Jason, who who turned her son's disappearance into something very positive as well. On the other hand, I know because, you know, I've taken interest in disappearances for years now that there are many parents and family members who kind of go the opposite direction. That, you know, I, for example, can't even begin to tell you how many websites that are supposed to feature you know, a, a missing person or something like that. You go to the website and the link doesn't even work anymore. Yeah. Where, what, can you, do you have any insight into that? Why some people choose to go one direction and then it seems like other people go the other? Well, there's some people that are real advocates, you know, like um, Kelly, for example, mm-hmm. right. uh, uh, Project Jason. Mm-hmm. Um, when Kelly's son disappeared, There was nothing out there in uh, Nebraska, where she was from, Mm -hmm. that was helping her. And she located us on on a web page and called us and said, is it okay if I come out to see what you're doing? Mm -hmm. And she made the trip about two or three times in a a row, came every Mm -hmm. year to our missing persons day. And then eventually Kelly decided to go out on her own and Mm -hmm. and become her own um, advocate. Um, I know many other families who have, um, you know, chosen to become advocates for the missing because their child went missing. And, you know, maybe the time uh, for us, you know, 18 years ago, there really wasn't a lot out there for us. Yeah, that's true. And we just... You know, we we didn't know where to turn. We didn't know what to do. Maybe we were doing all the wrong things, but we didn't know, and we had nobody to ask. And so we just decided that we would become advocates for this. My husband uh, was a counselor, and, you know, he Mm -hmm. kind of knew that, you know, helping people was the way to go. And Mm -hmm. um, we decided to turn our tragedy into something that would help other people so they wouldn't get so far down as we got yeah. in the beginning I and bet. you know I just bet. turn it around do you think though that that is the reason you know some people like it hurts so much to think about it that oh, you know af- after a while they just kind of want to move away from it even if it is a, a son or daughter because i'm telling you as a person and of course I, ho- I don't have any children but i hope that never happens to me with you know my parents or you know a family member i don't wish that upon anybody no. But so I'm not going to say I know how you feel. I don't. I don't. No. And, but there's a lot of people who, and I think it's um, the same way as going to a funeral or a wake, you know, and you go mm-hmm. and you, you you say to, you don't know what to say. So you say, yeah. oh, yeah, you know, I know how you feel. Um, but what happens with a lot of people is they, they want to tell you to move on, you know, stop. Yeah dwelling on it you know get past it you know you're not going to be able to do well it's i don't care if if that person eventually comes back being alive or deceased Mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if if it happens the family is always going to have that hole in their heart there's a hole there and it, it never heals up 
Yeah. And I think that's the, you know, that's the bottom line is that sometimes some people have such a deep hole, they wind up getting divorced. They can't cope with each other anymore. Yeah. They, um, they have health issues. They have um, uh, drinking problems, drug problems, because that's the only way that takes the pain away for them. And, you know, yeah. I, I don't like to hear that, but I do hear that a lot. Yeah, I hear you. that a lot, uh, families that just haven't been able to cope. I mean, they're, mm-hmm. they're strong for a while, but then they just lose it after a while. They don't, you know, don't think that there's any, any more hope. I mean, mm-hmm. that's uh, the reason why we, you know, started our organization. And know? the name of your organization, please. It's called the Center for Hope, and hope meaning um, healing our painful emotions. I mean, you know, how do you come up with some, <laughs> something mm-hmm. to add to that? But that's what it is. It's really painful. It's, it's, it's the worst pain that you can experience. Um, you know, every little thing around you reminds you of that person that's disappeared, and, you know, there's nothing you can do about it. It's, it's like... And then there's no closure, well, I don't even like that word, closure, resolve in any of these cases because when a person dies, they have a place to go to to grieve that person. There's mm-hmm. always a gravesite or something. But with a missing person, they have nothing, uh, which is why we have um, Missing Persons Day once a year, and uh, New York State, in New York State, we have a monument for missing people. Um, and where is it? A, where is it? Uh, it's right in downtown Albany, right next to the New York State Museum. Okay. It's uh, 20 feet high. It has a perpetual flame at the top. And uh, around the base, which is uh, 8 foot by 8 foot granite base, mm-hmm. um, it says, uh, as a symbol of our eternal hope, may this flame light their way home. And I, I have to tell you, there's been many times when I've been down there to that monument where there's a, a poster there, uh, a stuffed animal, flowers. People go there and sit and grieve. Yeah. They have a place to, to you know, actually feel that missing person. Um, there have been uh, candlelight vigils at that monument because people... You know, have somebody who's missing, and it's the place they want to go and have a vigil, just because they're hoping that that kind of publicity will bring that person back. Yeah. Now, Suzanne, she had at least one other sibling, right? You have a son. I have a son and a daughter. And and how how did that affect them? I mean, what? It was very difficult for them, although they were grown up. Susie was our youngest child. Mm-hmm. Um, my son was twelve. I'm going on 13 when she was born. My daughter was uh, almost nine, going on mm-hmm. 10. And um, so, you know, they they were kind of like second parents to them. My my son adored her. He, he'd take her to the concerts when she got to be her, you know, right age. Yeah, your daughter, um, was, your was, Suzanne, was a Rush fan. As she I was said. a Rush fan. I, yeah. I like Rush myself, yeah. And she, yeah. Had, about 20, she had about 23 CDs. Wow. Of Rush before she wow. disappeared, which I was amazed because mm-hmm. she was really into Rush. She had really and good whenever, musical taste. Uh, whenever Rush came to, you know, our local area here um, in Saratoga, SPAC, um, she, my son would take her. He didn't want her going to concerts by herself, so mm-hmm. he would take her. Mm-hmm. Um, just to tell you the age difference, when he went to his first year of college, she was going into first grade. Wow. <laughs> Just well, to give you. Yeah, well, I, well, you should know. Uh, I don't know if I told you that the first time we talked, but I have a, two brothers and a sister who are quite a bit older than I am as well. I actually have a sister who's – my brothers and my sister are all almost 20 years older than I am. So oh, there you go. I, I know. Well, yeah. I know, so it was the baby. Yeah. Yep, the baby, and everybody treated her, yeah. you know, Yes. kind of uh, that way. And, you know, it was hard for them. Um they were a little bit older, but I'll tell you, when I talk to families who have a child that's gone missing, and I'm, I'm saying child because everybody is somebody's child. I don't care who it is. Mm-hmm. 
you know, if you're 55 years old and you go missing, you were somebody's child at one yeah. point. But anybody who has a child that has gone missing and has young siblings, um, I usually tell those families, please, you know, do something with them, even if it's to take them out for an ice cream cone or something. Don't let them feel neglected because you become so focused in trying to find the missing person that you forget about the siblings. And I have heard stories about siblings who have, um, well, I know of one who committed suicide after uh, wow. how many years of the family being so focused in trying to find the young sibling mm-hmm. that she couldn't cope anymore. She just couldn't handle it anymore. So it, it you know, it's very difficult for them. Mm. They don't say anything, but they do feel neglected. Yeah. So. Um. Well, to, to wrap this up, what else? What else should be covered here? Where can pe- you know? Where can people reach you, my listeners? Uh, you have a nonprofit organization. Do you take donations? What? Yes. What else? What else do you want to talk about? Um, well, we can be reached at. Um, the, it's called the Center for Hope. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're in. We're in upstate New York. We're uh, twenty Prospect Street, Boston Spa, New York. One two zero two zero. I do have a web page, which is uh, hope the number four the missing dot org. Okay, hope for the missing so, with a four is the numer- numer- numeral four. Yeah, okay, yeah uh, dot org, and um, I can be reached by telephone, uh, which is also on our web page. But I'll give you the number. It's five one eight 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 four eight seven six one. Okay, great. And uh, those those telephone calls that come into the office, uh, we take them as they come in because I get about maybe 30 or 40 a week <laughs> missing people, so yeah. I have to take them as they come in. Are, can I ask you, are you working on any legislation or anything right now? Do you think that's behind you, or do you think you are going to do something even more regarding I politics? I think or? I would like to, you know uh, – look at some other things we haven't you know actually one of the things that we did do um you know we kind of got out of the legislation area for a while and Mm -hmm. we we produced uh decks of playing cards with Mm -hmm. um 52 missing person cases on the cards one on each card um the cards were passed out throughout new york state uh to the different jails Mm -hmm. and uh we actually, I think we've had over 30,000 cards out there, 30,000 decks of cards. Um, we uh, also produced um, coasters um, that were sent out to um, uh, the different bars and restaurants in the Capital District, and we, we picked out um, people who were missing through the Capital District for our mm-hmm. our. Uh, coasters, hoping that if somebody had a drink and, you know, loosened up a little bit yeah. um, on the back of the card, there's a place where they can either text or um, scan and, uh, you know, make a phone call to a, uh, you know, mm-hmm. place. So, you know, we got out of doing some legislation because we were in, involved in the, in the cards and the coasters. But there are other things that need to be, you know, resolved, and we, you know, there's still holes. There's still holes in the laws that you'd like to see closed. Oh yeah, there's lots of holes, and like okay. I said, I think from the time Susie disappeared to now, so much has happened for the older group of students, the older group of people that, you know, through our laws, um, I, I often get a phone call from an organization saying. If it wasn't for Susie Ann's law, you know, uh, this lady or this person would not have been able to get their child listed with the National Center and, you know, an Amber Alert wasn't, you know, set out or whatever. So, you know, it does make me proud. And unfortunately, mm-hmm. my husband is no longer with us. He passed away last year. Mm-hmm. And um, so it's a little harder for me to do things, but I'm still trying. I'm still mm-hmm. working at it. Right. And I will until I find my daughter. Okay. Uh, Mary, I, I can tell you, I'm going to be praying for you. I hope that my Thank listeners, so uh, I hope my listeners are praying for you. If, if that's their belief system 
and uh, I know we're all going to do what we can to try to get this resolved for you. We're not going to say closure, but we're going to say resolved. Okay. Okay. Yes, that's the word you want to use. You do never want to use closure with a family with a missing person because there's never any closure if you think about it. It's not the same as when a person dies from a disease or natural death. That's closure. Right. That's not. Mary, I, I've deeply enjoyed this interview, and I can't, I can't thank you enough for spending this time with me. All well, right. I thank you also for even interviewing me. Oh. That's great. Oh, thank you so much. You're welcome. And that was my August 22nd, 2016 interview. Yes, I still know the exact date with Mary Lyle, mother of Suzanne Lyle. I thank her for that interview, and I thank her even more For all the support she has shown over the entire eight years of Unfound's existence. And as I stated last year, here are some of the disappearances Unfound has gotten to cover with Mary's assistants. Peggy and Patty McDaniel, Craig Freer, Nicholas Masucci, Brian Sullivan, Dominique Holly Grisham, Audrey Heron. Before I tell you where Unfound is headed in year nine, let's do this. Unfound News. The Unfound now for August 2024 is out. I go over the still unsolved recent disappearance of William Orellano from Riverside, California. A wreck followed by an empty vehicle. We've had a few of those in Unfound's history. Next, for all the Patreon and YouTube supporters, the newest found episode is now available. I go over the disappearance to discovery of a woman who ripped off her employer before taking off. Finally, Orlando was a bust. I played horrible disc golf, and because my voice is still not 100%, as you can tell by this recording... There was no karaoke either. Dang. So then, what can you expect from Unfound in year number nine? Most importantly, nothing is changing with the podcast. I continue to believe the format is perfect. We are doing great work. I'm the only true crime podcaster to appear in a murder trial. No other true crime podcast has been featured on international TV more than Unfound over the past year. The podcast has the support of an FBI agent, a retired NYPD lieutenant, and an on-duty investigator who solved an almost 80-year-old disappearance. What else more is there to say? There is no reason to change. But here are some areas that will see increased attention before the ninth anniversary of Unfound arrives in 2025. First, and for a longer dissertation on this, please go to either the Facebook page or the discussion group. Whether you know it or not, every podcaster got screwed over by iTunes about six months ago. By ordering how it counts downloads, they did this for no scientific reason. They just decided to do it. This effectively cut in half the downloads registered, which then cut in half the revenue that all podcasts get from advertising. So for 2024, I'm making half of what I made in 2023. Yes, really. And this podcast was already losing money as it is. Meaning you're going to hear me talk a lot more. And yes, dare I say guilting you into monetarily supporting this podcast that you listen to every week. Even if it's just asking for $2 a month on Patreon. That's less than the cost of a king size candy bar, by the way. Also... I've been talking about the database being constructed, and to be clear, I'm not doing it. I am uh, supervising. It's being made by one of Unfound's most dedicated listeners and supporters. She is more than up to the task. 
I really believe when this database is done with it having many more parameters than you'll find in any disappearance list out there, that it will revolutionize how we all think about these cases. That is not hyperbole. I expect it to be done sometime in 2025. Also over the next year, I'm going to be reaching out to police departments. I think I can help them even though I think they don't think I can help them. It will be up to me to convince them. My plan is to approach smaller police agencies who probably are more eager for help than the larger ones. I will expect them to give me the entire file. I know, I know they're not going to do that. My argument will be that if the Texas Rangers can entrust disappearance files to college kids like they'll be doing this semester, then I can be trusted with anything investigators would ever send me. And by the way, this has actually already happened where a police department with the help of Julia Cowley reached out to me to give my best insight into a disappearance in Ohio. So this is not a crazy plan to put into action for the next 12 months. Finally, I would admit that this year I got a bit of writer's block for the TV series that I've bumping around in my head. Of course, when the podcast itself is always job number one, reaching out to families, talking to them, the writing, the recording, it's always number one. But also, as Kip Winger said, interruption is the destroyer of creativity, meaning it's tough to get into a creative flow when the main job of what I do is non-creativity. The podcast is all about facts, cold and hard. Whereas making a good TV series about disappearances cannot be like that. Even though I want the show to be representative of what goes on in the real world regarding investigations. And if you're wondering, my idea is a mixture of the X-Files and the original Hawaii Five O. It could play on Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, wherever. And let's be honest, it seems like anybody can get a show on those services these days. <clears throat> so I have to refocus on this because nobody has done a missing persons fiction show correctly or very well yet. Overall, what I'm saying is, more than any other true crime podcast out there, Unfound is thinking big in a lot of different areas. And I believe all of these goals can be reached. And that ends the 8th anniversary episode. I'm Ed Denzel, and you've been listening to Unfound.